Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about ANOVA, or Analysis of Variants. There will actually be two videos associated with this slide set. The next one will talk about a more general methodology called F-Test, and ANOVA is really just a special case of that general methodology. As usual, up on top here, there'll be a, a link to the playlist all about regression, and down below, there'll be a PDF version of these slides. All right, so ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance, although that's a little bit of a misnomer because it's really talking about analysis of different means amongst different groups, uh, although it is an analysis of the variability around those means. The ANOVA model is the model that's presented right here, and so you have observations Y that are grouped, and so they're grouped here by the subscript J. Each of those uh, groups have their own mean, that's mu J, but there's a constant variance sigma squared around those means. Uh, there's two different ways you can write this model, at least there's probably many more than that, uh, and so I provided both those two up here. Uh, sometimes it's useful to think about one versus the other. In particular, in a bit, we'll be talking about residuals, and as a reminder, residuals are estimated errors. And so you can see here that those errors are simply the observations minus the mean for the group that that observation is associated with. As we move forward, uh, we're going to have capital J groups, and we're going to have N subscript J observations in each group. The second way of writing the model also makes clear the assumptions that this model has. Right? In particular, we have a common mean for each group, uh, and then we have assumptions about the errors here. The errors are themselves normally distributed, they have a common variance, and they are independent. Just to try to uh, fix some ideas here, we can take a look at what this analysis of variance model looks like. So this is a graphical depiction of the model. This depiction happens to have six different groups. The different groups are each represented by different bell-shaped curves. These are the probability density functions for six different normal distributions. And the difference amongst them is that they just have a different mean. You'll notice here that uh, each of those bell-shaped curves have the same size and, right, and height. And so uh, that's because we have this common variance assumption. The only thing that's different amongst the groups is the different mean. So you just take that bell-shaped curve and you shift it along the x-axis to, in this case, the six different group means. All right, uh, here's the data set we're going to be taking a look at within the context of this video. Uh, we've seen this data set before if you've been following along with these videos, but very briefly, this is a data set where you fed mice six different possible diets, that's what's on the x-axis, and you recorded how long each of those, those mice lived. And so you have variability here amongst the mice lifetimes within each of the six different diet groups. Now, the fact that the points are uh, not centered right above the diets on the x-axis is just because I've jittered them. So there's nothing going on there, just helps you see all the data points. Okay, so these are the type of data that we're going to use as analysis of variance model. And one of the main questions then uh, that you might want to ask as you get started is, are the means different? And so if you take that into English and you create a hypothesis written in English, you might say a null hypothesis says that all the means are equal. Whereas your alternative hypothesis says that at least one of the means is different. So you notice that alternative hypothesis is just the opposite of the null, right? The null says all the means are equal, and the alternative just says at least one of them is different, right? They could all be different. Two of them could be different than the rest, right? So there's lots of different combinations there. So that alternative isn't ex very explicit, um, but it's just the opposite of the null. If we want to take and convert this into a statistical hypothesis using the model we showed a couple slides ago, then what we're going to do is we're going to say that the null hypothesis takes all of those individual group means mu j and makes them equal to one particular value mu. We don't know what that value is, but all the means of all the groups have that same value mu j. In contrast, the alternative hypothesis says that at least one of those means is different from another mean or different from the rest. Thus, you get the mu j is not equal to mu j prime, uh, where there's j and j prime are two different uh, indices for the different groups. Now, typically, that's how you'll see these models or these hypotheses written. I like to think about them as models for the data. And so I kind of prefer what I've written here on the right-hand side, where the null model says that the observations are iid normal with a common mean mu and a variance sigma squared. The alternative hypothesis 
really just says that each of the groups have their own mean, otherwise the observations are independent and a constant variance. And if you think of it this latter way, then thinking about this construction of a NOVA table and the F test that's related, I think becomes a bit more clear. Really what we're gonna do is we're going to compare these two models. The one where the means are all the same and another one where the means are all different. Despite the fact that the alternative hypothesis just says that at least one of the means are different. Okay. All right, so basically the ANOVA table just helps us to organize the computations we need to make for comparing these two models. So here is the laborious sort of mathematics that get involved in an ANOVA table. Um, basically what I want to point out to you is first the total line. So on that bottom line there, the SST, the sums of squares total, is just taking all the observations and subtracting the overall mean y bar, squaring it and then summing them up. So that's the sum of the squares relevant relative to an overall model. The next line, or it's the next column over where it says df, that's degrees of freedom. Since we only have a single mean for all the groups, we have just one parameter for the mean in that model. So our degrees of freedom are n minus one. Now, if we move up one line, in that line above, we have the sum of squared errors, or some might call it the residual sum of squares. And in that calculation, we're thinking about each group having its own mean. So you'll notice there's a Y bar subscript J. So that's the mean for group J. And now we take all the observations, subtract that group mean, square it, and sum them all up, and we get SSE. Okay. If we move over, because we have J different groups, we, each of them have their own mean. We have n minus j degrees of freedom. So that's where you get the n minus j. All right, so now uh, one way to think about this table is to say that those two columns, the sum of squares columns and the degree of freedom column, those two have to sum to the total. So the line that says factor a right now, uh, an error, if you sum the sum of the squares there, you get the sum of the squares total. If you take the degree of freedom column and you add the factor A and error, you get the total degrees of freedom. Okay, so that's one way to think about it. Um, another way to think about it is that that sum of squares A basically provides uh, a weighted average of the variability of the different group means relative to the overall mean Y bar. And if you take the degree of freedom column, that is just always the number of groups minus one. Now, this line right here that says factor A, I, um, I haven't mentioned yet in the video, but this is really a one-way analysis of variance table or one-way ANOVA table. There are ANOVA tables when you get to more factors, and so that factor line really corresponds in this case to group, okay? But if we have more factors, more explanatory variables, then we'll have additional lines in more complex versions of these ANOVA tables. Okay, so we've got those first two columns sort of sorted out. Now the next step is to look at the mean square column. That mean square column is always the sum of square column divided by the degree of freedom column. So you'll see sum of squares A divided by J minus one and sum of squared error divided by N minus J. Now a little, little fact here, that sum of squared error divided by N minus J is in fact our estimate for sigma squared. Now typically we don't do the same calculation for total because it's not needed with where we're going. All right, so now I know I have some notation on the side. What was it? So J is the number of groups and J is the number of observations per group. N is the total number of observations. Y bar J is the mean within group J and Y bar is then the overall average of all the uh, data. Okay, so now we're gonna take this ANOVA table and we're going to expand it to the right because the quantities we need are actually to the right here. So the first few columns are exactly the same, but now we've gotten rid of all those uh, crazy summation symbols. And the next column over says that we're going to calculate this F statistic where we just take the mean square uh, column values and divide them. So we have MSA divided by MSE. That's what we call F statistic. And then we're going to calculate a P value using this F statistic. And so the key is now, if you remember your definition of a p-value, it's the probability of observing a test statistic as or more extreme than that observed if the null hypothesis is true. So first thing is we have to assume the null hypothesis is true, and now we need to figure out the distribution for our test statistic. Our test statistic is this F statistic. And so that has, if the null hypothesis is true, an F distribution, and F distributions have two parameters. They're both called degrees of freedom, 
First is called numerator degrees of freedom and the second is called denominator degrees of freedom. If you go over to the degrees of freedom column, you'll notice that the degrees of freedom here are exactly the degrees of freedom for factor A, that's the numerator degrees of freedom, and then the degrees of freedom for the error, that's the denominator degrees of freedom. Okay, so you get that F statistic, and now larger values indicate evidence against the null hypothesis. And so what we're going to do to calculate the p-value is calculate the probability that we could have observed an F statistic larger than this F statistic if the null hypothesis is true. Written as a probability statement, we have a probability that F is a random F with J minus one numerator degrees of freedom and minus J denominator degrees of freedom is greater than this ratio MSA divided by MSE. Now, if you've been following along in this video uh, or in this playlist really, or all of my playlists, I have not before talked about an F distribution. So here's my one slide summary of an F distribution. Again, it has two parameters. Uh, in this picture, we have five numerator degrees of freedom and 300 denominator degrees of freedom. Uh, in this context, we're always looking for tail probabilities, right, to the large values for F. And so that's indicated here by this magenta area. But basically, F distribution, the densities for F distributions all look like this kind of curve, right? Kind of a peak and then a tail, long tail to the right. Right, similar to uh, gamma distributions that we've seen before. Okay, so all we need on that previous slide, we need everything we needed can be calculated from these sufficient statistics. The number of observations per group, the mean within each group, and the standard deviation within each group, or the variance if you prefer. Now, you can of course do this calculation by hand. Here I show the results of doing that calculation by hand. Uh, but generally, we're not going to bother doing it by hand, right? That's what software is for. Uh, I will note though that there's a slight discrepancy between the values that I have here and the values we get when we do it automatically, and it has to do with some rounding. Not that important. Okay, as a graphical model, if we're thinking about what these two models in this uh, F test or in this ANOVA comparison, we're thinking about one model that has a common mean for all the groups. That's represented here by the red line. The alternative model says that each group has its own mean. So we have those different blue lines, one for each group, right? So visually, that's what we're trying to compare are these two possible models. Okay, uh, R code for a one-way analysis of variance just uses a function in R called ANOVA. You have to fit the regression first um, and then run the ANOVA on it. You'll notice here that I haven't really talked about it, but we're in a playlist all about regression. Yet we're talking about an ANOVA model. The model itself looked quite a bit different from a regression model. But I want to remind you, maybe you could go back and watch the categorical video, that this ANOVA model is really just a reparameterization of a regression model where we have dummy variables for all levels of a categorical variable except for the reference level. Okay, so they're the same model, just reparameterized with different parameters. So here's our ANOVA table in R, and it looks very similar to what we've seen before, uh, but R uh, has decided to not include that total row. So you see that you have diet, that's factor A in our previous table, you have residuals or errors, uh, and then you would have a total row below it. But if you wanted to recreate that, you could simply just sum up the degrees of freedom, that gives you the degrees of freedom total, sum up the sum of squares, that gives you the sum of squares total. Okay. This small p-value provides evidence against the null model. Remember that model says that the means are all the same, but also that the observations are independent. They are really the errors are independent, normally distributed and have a common variance. So you want to go through your diagnostics and check and make sure that the model uh, isn't violating some other assumptions before you really conclude that those means are in fact not the same. All right, so that concludes this video all about ANOVA. In our next video, we'll talk about a general methodology called an F-test, of which this ANOVA is just one special case. Hope to catch you there.